Used to be in a pit There's nothing about it That I miss I can deny it You saved my soul And pulled me out of the dark Now there's nothing better Than your love I'm up here breathing easy Just taking in the view Holding the hand that free me Just look what love can do Now my head's in the clouds t-shirts man knock it off quit talking amongst yourselves like y'all love each other out in the lobby jesus lives in the sanctuary what are you talking about y'all better get in here yes i love this time of year can y'all feel fall right haven't your hoodies been like crying out put me on put me on and you're like i don't know i'm afraid i'll get sweaty Right, I can feel fall in the air. Like, I mean, I got up this morning and it was just like cool. And I was like, yes, I'm so ready to stop sweating so much. I know none of y'all people sweat. I sweat a lot. This is it's part of being like this size. This size people sweat. So I'm so excited about UNA. I'm so excited you're here. A couple years ago when Kyle was talking to me about a mission summit and a conference and we were talking about what, what should this be? What should this look like? I remember in that conversation we said this. I wish that we could get like a stadium of people, like, like an entire stadium. I wish our venue could be a stadium. Even though I know the conference might only have a couple hundred people. Because really, I think that's what missions is like. Missions is like God told everybody to go. That's the number of people he called to go. And we all have a missions heart. But the truth is, a lot of times there, there are few. Jesus says himself that, that when you pray, pray for laborers. Right? Because the harvest is plenty. But the, the laborers are few. I love this moment. I get hyped for Emanate, and I'm excited to be here. A couple things I want to talk about as we get ready to go into worship, just to give you an idea of what tonight is going to be like, what tomorrow is going to be like, tomorrow night, those things. Tonight, Pastor Gary is bringing the word. 
I'm telling you, if you're going to take notes, you better, you better write with both hands, man. This joker is going to give them to you. Scriptures and points and that kind of stuff. And I can tell you this. I, I watched him operate in the prophetic last year. He didn't even know. I watched him pray and speak things into people's lives that nobody could have known. He could not have known. I'm excited about what I think God's going to do through him. Man, this team right here, these guys right here have been going in, ready to lead us into worship. We're excited about it. Tomorrow morning, we come back here at 9 a.m. Doors open at 8.30. At 9 a.m., we're going to worship. We're going to have sessions. Tomorrow, the first part of the day, really think creativity and innovation. We got a special guest that's coming with us, Grammy Award-winning friend of ours, writes kind of in the pop genre of music. John Bellion is his name. If you go and Google him, I want to tell you, all of his lyrics aren't Christian. I believe his heart loves Jesus, but I'm just going to tell you, if you go YouTube him, I don't know that all of his lyrics know the Lord. But man, we love him. He's a good friend. He's going to talk about influencing, writing, like those kind of things. So we're excited. Carruthers is going to be involved in that. We're going to have a, an address from our director tomorrow morning. We're going to talk through fundraising. Anybody need some money for missions? How about money for a water bill? Anybody need money for a water bill, gas bill, right? <laughs> So we're going to talk about fundraising. We're going to talk about strategies for social media. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. I got two guys that are going to, that are going to hone in on what it means to take a risk. People who like just up and left their jobs to do missions. We're going to talk about those kind of things. That's tomorrow morning. Tomorrow afternoon, after we break from lunch, we're going to get our souls nourished. Our very own spiritual mother, like one of the spiritual mothers of our group, Crystal Alley, has got a word prepared. It's going to be so good. Pastor Shero from Hope NYC is going to be sharing about how to preach to the nations. Aren't you hyped to hear from her, right? So she's going to be sharing about that. We got that prepared. And we also have a whole session about operating in the prophetic. That's enough from me. Are you ready to worship? Are you ready to worship? Would you stand all over the place? And with your own words, would you just invite him into this place? Ask him to minister to us as we minister to, to him. Would you tell him how wonderful he is? How grateful you are for his presence in your life? We are so thankful for you. We bless your name. We bless your name, Jesus, that you would call us, that you would love us, that you would know us. We bless the name of the Lord. God, we honor you. We recognize that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. We recognize that no matter what I have faced up until this moment, you never leave, you never forsake me, you walk with me. Though I go through the valley, you are there. Though I find myself on the mountaintop, you are there. And I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful. I love you, I praise you, I honor you. Can I get all the missionaries in the house to say amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being an m and Let's kick this off. You can come forward and worship if you would like. Just feel freedom in this place tonight. I haven't seen the sun in the sky now for days. That you would come and take the dark clouds away. But now I'm hanging on to every word that I heard you say. I'm learning what it means when you tell me to wait until the light comes. I'm not afraid of the dark. I will remain strong until the light comes on. I'm not afraid, no, I'm not afraid of the dark I will remain strong until the light comes on I'm not afraid, no, I'm not afraid I was in a tunnel seeking light at the end I'm not afraid, no, I'm not afraid But my time in the tunnel taught me light is within I'm not afraid, no. And now I'm so calm I'm not afraid of the dark hey, hey. I will remain strong Until the light comes 
comes on I'm not afraid, no I'm not afraid of the dark
You can see some of those places. You can travel with us, see some of those places. But I can tell you this, you can be standing in some of the most beautiful places on planet Earth and still be blind. The Bible says that you can have eyes but not see, have ears but not hear. The prophet said, I went here and I couldn't find you. And I went here and I couldn't find you. And it was when my soul was still, I heard you in a small, still voice. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a breath. This weekend for a minute, we're going to stop focusing on everything around us. We're going to look to him, and I pray we're going to see his love. I want you to be seated just for a second. Let me tell you this. We got a little bit of a schedule. We got some things we're going to try to do this weekend, um, but we're not in a hurry. There's one agenda. That's to please the Father. That's it. That is it. So let me tell you this. I don't know what you get at work. I don't know what you get at school. Here's what I want you to just relax, okay? Look at your neighbor and say, just, just relax. Just chill. Jeremy, one of the guys in the office, Jeremy, we were in the office the other day, and he yelled at me. He was like, relax. He said, we just got to tell people to relax. That's what I want you to do. I just want you to relax. I want you to see his love and experience his presence. There's a scripture that we live by, me and my wife, and, and, and a lot of people do. It's in Proverbs 11. It says, one man gives and grows richer. Another man withholds and grows poorer. Right? One man gives, he grows richer. That's Brian's unauthorized version. Right? It's not the King James version. Emma, it's my version of the Bible. Right? Stop trying to find it. Okay, it's my version, Proverbs 11:24. One man gives, grows richer. 
another man withholds suffers poverty there's a lot of things we're dreaming for at far flung so if you came to a place to see dreams die this is not the right place to be and there's a lot of things we're believing for things we want to do i think we have a slide that even shows some of the things we're hoping to get done in 2022 we want to sponsor and do some things for the together project coming up in japan we need about twenty three thousand dollars for that um we want to to build another church in thailand our children's program adventures with far flung we want to put a roof on the church in mozambique our building where we're feeding kids in ecuador needs some things and so here's what i want you to do i want you to know where you can go and what you can do to be a part of that i want you to try in your life to do two things I want you to be generous, right? I want you to be generous regularly. Be generous regularly, right? So that uh, means on a regular basis, give and, and be generous sacrificially. Time, talent, treasure. So these are some things you can get involved with here with Far Flung. If you'd like to figure out how you can give, you can make a check and you can make it out to Far Flung Tin Can. You can also give on Cash App or Venmo. You can go to our website, farflungtincan.com. You can give that way. Um, we'll throw this up a couple times through the weekend. Here's something really cool. Somebody had a, like a really big heart to be generous, and they said that they would match the first $5,000 that comes in. Right? So there's, a, there's a, a family that decided they would do that. I happen to know that it's not necessarily a family that's just super wealthy. It's a family who gives regularly and gives sacrificially. It's a family that we could put up there who has some needs of their own. They said, listen, I wanna match $5,000. So here's what I want you to do, just be a part of that. Can I pray for you that God will speak to you this weekend about giving, is that cool? Lord, each one of the people here, people who are watching online, people who are seeing what we wanna do, what we wanna be involved in, I pray God that you would help us do more than what we're capable of. I pray you would help our money do more than what it's capable of. God, I pray that you would in, give us a very clear understanding of what you would call us to give. God, I ask that you would that, we would, that we would never feel manipulated into giving. God, I pray no manipulation in any of this, that people are just stirred to give and get involved, that you would do that. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Isn't that easy? Isn't it easy? Like giving money, it's easy to talk about that. You know why? I don't want your money. I don't want it. I'm going to give some of mine. I don't want all that. I just want you to get involved with what the Lord's doing, right? So give to your church. Give those places. Let Far Flung maybe be a part of your generosity. You want to worship some more? Is that cool? Is it cool if we spend some more time in his presence, right? Why don't you stand with me? So would you lead us in a prayer can we all just lift our hands in the sanctuary Holy Spirit we just ask you to come and move tonight we just ask that you would come and blow through this place God inspire us with the breath from heaven God we ask that you would bring us into unity God because we know that's where you send down your anointing is when we're all in one mind and one spirit and in one accord, like in the upper room in Acts chapter two, when they were in one mind, one prayer, one spirit, one faith. Can we all just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to come in unity? Holy Spirit, come tonight, flow through us. We invite your spirit to flow. We invite your spirit to refresh us. Baptize us in fire, Holy Spirit. Make my heart 
when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will feel me come now spirit when you move you make my heart now when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will feel me Let heaven on in Come a rest on us Come a rest on us Fire and wind Come and do it again Open up the gates Let heaven on in Come a rest on us Say fire and wind Fire and wind Say open up the gates
can't do it without you. Can't do it without you, Holy Spirit. Can't do it without your 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 so 
everything that binds me down comes on Let your river drown it, drown it. And anything in darkness cannot remain. Only fire, fire. I get your prayer. Everything. Let it come unchanged. Anything, anything, anything in darkness cannot only fight it up. Everything that binds me Open up, let the light. Open up, let the light in. Open up, let the light. Open up, let the light in. Open up, let the light in. Open up, let the light in. Clean house, Lord. Oh. Open up, let the light in. 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 Expel every dark thing. Open up, let the light in. Open up, let the light in. Open up, let the light in. Better is one 
149 says that the praise is the loud shouts of praise in the mouths of God's people are like a sword in the hand of the Lord. One more time, lift up a shout. Lift up a shout over the nations. The praises in the mouths of God's people are like a sword in the hand of the Lord. So let a praise out. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, let's just stay there one more second. There's a breakthrough on the praise tonight. God is seated upon the throne and circled around the heavens and the earth. The earth is the footstool and everything therefore belongs to him. Yes, let's just lift him up. Lift him up. Lift up the name of Jesus.
say you are you are holy come on let's hear the voices getting better and um, I know that only broken people need breakthroughs though you don't you don't need a breakthrough unless you're broken and if you're not careful in a conference where we come from missions 
that can be so much about doing. And we're going to go and do, and I love it. I give my life to missions. But the scripture says he's near the brokenhearted. And I tell you what I feel in the Father's heart tonight is the one who's struggling to sing the song. Man, he loves you so much. That one tonight that you feel off. You just feel off. You don't feel it. You know what I hear the Father saying? And I, I don't know that I've ever like put three words together quite so boldly, but I feel like the Lord's saying, I will heal you. I will. I did not hurt you, but I will take responsibility for healing you. And he loves for us to sing by his goodness and his greatness. I remember we were on stage singing to a bunch of kids at the conference in the Opry Land. You remember? We used to go up there and sing. I think it was there. You led a song, and, and it's real wordy, and I don't remember all the words, but I remember this little part that said like a... When I thought I lost... You knew where to find Yeah, it's me To my Picked up all my pieces Pieces Put me back together Defender My Somebody sing that on the team Just that one little part Singing that over to him. I took all my pieces and put me back together. Cause you are the defender of my heart. When I thought I lost me, you knew where I left me. You reintroduced me to your great love. And you picked up all my pieces and put me back together. Cause you are the defender of my heart. You are the defender. You'll never stop fighting for me. Stop fighting for The fear is that tomorrow is all about filling up. And the fear is that there's some broken vessels like here right now. And everything that anybody tries to pour in you just keeps falling out because like you, you're riddled with holes. You've been broken and beaten and battered so long, you're riddled with holes. And I think there's, there's something that God can do in this moment that will prepare you for the word that's about to come. You know what I've been feeling? I know for sure that God wants to do this weekend, even in this moment. 
there's so many of us. Man, our families are like under so much attack. I wrote that in my prayers. Like coming into far flung, coming into Eminate, it just feels like so many of us, our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, are so many people, so many families are under attack. There's so many people, even like not just your family, you were on the edge of like being hopeless. And I don't think we're supposed to go into the next moment and you, you stay kind of broken. So we're going to take a second to, to let the body minister to the body. So if that's you, I want to pray with you. If you're broken, if you're hurting, if you're at the end of your rope, if your family is just under fire, if you guys are going through it, I want to pray with you. I don't care if you're on stage, you crawl from out from under an instrument or somebody else can play or sing, it don't matter. But I don't think we need to move any further until we give opportunity. So if that's you, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna count to three. It's gonna be very simple. I'm gonna count to three. I want you to get to the altar. We're gonna pray. The Lord's gonna move. One, two, three. I just want you to get down here. You say, man, I need, I need this weekend. I'm broken. I'm, I got a lot going on in my life got a lot going on in my family. I don't quite feel right. I don't quite feel like everything's together. Feeling kind of like, here's what I want you to do. If you're sitting beside somebody, I don't, I've never done this. If you're sitting beside somebody, I want you to ask them, turn to your left or right, say, hey, do you need to go down for prayer? Let me go down with you. Right now, just turn to them and say, hey, listen, you need to go down for prayer. I'll go down with you. So I'll go down and pray with you. I'm going to ask a few people, Pastor Gary. Uh, I'm going to ask Crystal, just some of our team, some of our crew that pray, that know how to pray. Crystal, your crew, Whitney, Carolyn. Guys, if you want to, we're going we're gonna to pray. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to minister Christian different if I didn't say your name but you're part of our team yeah I can't heal you but that's easy for my Jesus and I can't save you but that's easy for my Jesus and I can't free you but that's easy yeah that's easy for my Jesus I can't save you, but that's easy for my Jesus. And I can't heal you, but that's easy for my Jesus. And I can't free you, but that's easy. Yeah, that's easy for my Jesus. And I can't save you. But that's easy for my Jesus. And I can't heal you, but that's easy for my Jesus. And I can't free you, but that's easy for my Jesus. Yeah, that's easy. And I can't save you, but that's easy. For my Jesus, and I can't heal you, but that's easy. For my Jesus, and I can't free you, but that's easy. For my Jesus, yeah, that's easy.
up all my peace, put me back together, you are the divine, cause freedom is available, healing is available, deliverance available.
I'm going to ask that as soon as you're done, I'm going to ask you to join me on stage. And, and Pastor Gary, I want you to be ready. Like, I'm, I'm not be ready. Like, like, he wasn't. Like, he's not chomping at the bit right now. <laughs> but, um, I really, and, and Christian's going to come and, and kind of pray a ceiling prayer over this moment. Um, she's one of the ones that lives in the firefight of prayer ministry over far flung. And so um, I'm not having her pray so you can hear her. Listen, I'm having her pray because I think God hears her when she prays. And she frequently prays for us. And, um, and so I want her to pray. Talked about different things to pray over and uh, I really feel like this is like a ministry moment to the body, not so much like we're praying for the nations. We got, we're going to do that. We're missions, but um, if, you, if you're here and you got a lot going on in your family, it's a lot of people. I know a lot of people got a lot of stuff going on. Would you just like maybe get somebody's hand so you can be in agreement with someone? If that's you, say, so, man, I got a lot going on in my family. Would you just kind of join with some people? If that's you, I'm not telling her what to pray, but I'm just, what I'm going to say, I want you to be in agreement that God's going to work this stuff out. God's going to work this stuff out. This chaos, stopping in the name of Jesus. And then she's going to pray until the moment, and the next person you're going to hear after she prays is Pastor Gary. And I'm going to say, buckle up. I believe he's got a word from the mouth of the Lord for us. Right? in our lives. Thank you for working in our families. Thank you that in the suffering, in the trials, in the hardship, you are faithful. Thank you that in the chaos, you are working it for our good. That there is never a moment where you are not working all things together for our good. And so we thank you. In the moments we don't understand, we thank you. In the moments that are painful, we thank you. In the moments that make us question, wait, are you still good? We thank you because you are. Our circumstances don't decide your goodness. Your goodness decides your goodness. And you are good all the time. There is never a moment where you are not good and you are not faithful and you are not present. And so I just pray over every family represented here tonight. And I thank you that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. That you are good in every moment and we get to look to you because you are where our help comes from. We get to hide under the shadow of your wings that you are our protection. You are our stable place. You are the rock and the foundation that never moves. It never shakes. When our our surroundings, when our circumstances are shaken, you never shake, you never change. And I thank you that even in all of these needs, all of the needs represented, financial needs, emotional, physical, everything, all of the needs, really what we need is your son. Really what we need is Jesus. Because if we can just get a glimpse of Jesus, everything else, it just fades into the background. This is all for Jesus. Every bit of this is for Jesus. And so we honor your son tonight. And we ask that you would have your way, King Jesus. Have your way in our lives, we surrender. We yield to your presence because we trust that you are good at all times. There is no one like you. There is no one like you. We thank you. We honor you. Do what you want to do here tonight. And I ask that it would just echo through the generations. 
that what happens here tonight would not stay here, but that it would go to the nations, that it would go home to our families, that it would continue to impact generations to come. Because your kingdom starts small and it grows and it grows and it grows. We thank you, Jesus. You can have a seat. <laughs> we lost our speaker. Uh oh. This is, Gary Keelan is coming to bat. This guy, you know, uh, he's been on more trips than most. And this is only the second time I've been in service with him ministering in the States. Usually we're like sitting outside a grass hut. This is, we like to say like, Gary and I go places where all the props are kicked out. This is like the second time I've been with them with the props. <laughs> so, um, I'm so excited that he's speaking tonight. Sometimes I take teams and I push the ministry adventure a little, probably too far. <laughs> and so what I, when I do, and I'm like, oh, okay, we're really, we're really taking some risks here. And so I looked at Gary I'm standing on the edge here like, uh-oh, have we gone too far? I looked at Gary, and as I turn around, he shoves me over the cliff, and we just go head first. So uh, I'm, I'm just ready. I got nothing else to say. Gary the Rhino. <laughs> Can we just thank God for Kyle and Far Flung Tin Can and the vision? And can we give Jesus a loudest shout? I mean, loud, rambunctious. Get radical with your praise. That's what our mouths should be used for is my Bible says this. See, you got to have a made up mind, Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The connectivity between our mouth and praise some people think, well, I can praise God in my mind, but that's not what that passage says. It says we have to use our, our mouth is important because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, on and on and on we go. Uh, so it's important. Thank God that I'm in a place where people worship God and praise God. And let me say this, I appreciate Brian for operating and flowing in the spirit and while I was down here praying for some people, the Lord showed me that what was taking place is God is preparing a people here. And a part of that is the God repairing the breach, restoring the paths to dwell in, so to speak. And how many of you know he's a restorer of the broken down walls of Nehemiah? You know, Nehemiah had a word and he had wood. That's all he had, a word from the king and wood from the king. How many of you know he repaired the broken down walls of the city? And you and I are a city set on a hill and you're also a vessel that God wants to pour into so you can get poured out when you get turned upside down. So I'm reminded of the story. This is free right here. This is not my message, uh, but it's, it's free, okay? Uh, so I won't charge you anything for this, but the story is told of how Elisha picks up the mantle, mantle of Elijah. He crosses the Jordan River. The Jordan River parts. He goes over into the first place he goes to is Jericho. Jericho means a cursed place. So the first place he went when he got the double portion was into a cursed place. And he made this uh, uh, announcement. He said, he looked at the city and he said, the city's pleasant, the water is not, but the ground is barren. What he was noticing is fruit would grow up on the trees only to fall off before it reached maturity. And it was absolutely inedible. They couldn't eat it, couldn't do anything with it. And the reason being is Jacob's well had been poisoned over a period of time. So they were actually pouring water that was poisoned on the crops that they were getting ready to eat. And this was the case. And everything looked all right. Everything looked good. It smelled good. It sounded 
sounded good because he said the city is pleasant. It was a scenic city. But here's what I want you to see. He had the solution to the poison well. He had the solution to a city that was pleasant, the water being naught and the ground being barren. Here's what the solution was. Bring me a new vessel. And when I get that new vessel in my hand, I'm going to put salt in the new vessel. And anybody that reads the Bible knows that salt is a preservative. And he's put salt in the vessel. He went over to the well, poured out the salt out of the new vessel. And immediately that water was healed and the city was healed. You talk about a mission right there. So what was happening in this altar was God was calling you back to the potter's house to make again a new vessel so you could house and contain what he wants to pour into you tonight so that then later you could get poured out and cities and nations are going to be altered and changed by your destiny that has been altered tonight right there in just a few moments there. God did it. Amen. So those of you who not even know God's got more, once he gets a vessel repaired, guess what he's getting ready to do? Pour into you. Amen. And that's a precursor for where I'm going tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, probably familiar passage. But I want to preach the call of the wild. The call of the wild. And those of you that know me know I'm called to missions, evangelism, and outreach. That's what I'm all about. And that's what I've been put on the planet to do. The second part of that is not only, number one, should I be reaching the lost and setting an, an example and spreading the good news, but I should always keep the body of Christ eyes how many of you know we major on the minors and minor on the majors? How many of you know my role in the body of Christ is to turn the body of Christ toward a harvest field because your leader and commander-in-chief Jesus, the captain of your salvation, said this. The, he said, the, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest, send forth laborers into the harvest field. And how many of you know when he sends you, he equips you to do the work of the kingdom, and that's that's what my job is because the master's calling saying come and dine you can sit at Jesus table anytime he said go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full so my role in the body of Christ is to prov provoke the body of Christ to turn and focus on the lost it doesn't matter if it's in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or in our case here tonight the uttermost parts of the earth so this is a weird way for me to start a message, but I'm going to whet your appetite with a few quotes here. I've never done this before. I'm going to do it. We're at, this is far-flung tin can, emanate conference. You never know what's going to happen. And that's why I love it so much. Kirk Cameron said this, if you had the cure to cancer, wouldn't you share it? You have the cure to death. Get out there and share it. Billy Graham, my one purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes through knowing Christ. Charles Spurgeon, now strap on, put your seat backs and your tray tables in their locked and upright positions for this one. Charles Spurgeon, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Let that sink in. I'll repeat that. That's worth repeating. Don't blame me. This is Charles Spurgeon. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. David Jeremiah says, it's a sad fact that the vast majority of people who sit in the pews on Sunday never tell anybody about Christ on Monday. C.S. Lewis the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Ray Comfort. <laughs> I figure with that kind of name, he's going to say something that would comfort, but that's not the case. If you are not concerned about your neighbor's salvation, then I am concerned for yours. From a man by the name of Ray Comfort. Wow. Wow. I just thought I was rough. Rebecca M. Pippert, 
being an extrovert isn't essential to evangelism, obedience, and love are. Wow. Martin Luther, it is the duty of every Christian to be Christ to his neighbor. Mark Cahill says, if you don't talk about Jesus, then maybe you don't love him half as much as you think you do. And then Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always to the very ends of the earth. Matthew chapter 3 Call of the wild. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, and he quotes Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 right here. He said, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes, notice this, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt about his waist. Somebody say, John had an appearance. Turn to your neighbor and say, John had an appearance. Very important, very important. His food was locust and wild honey. Turn to your neighbor and say, John had an appetite. John had an appearance, and John had an appetite. Glory to God. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming where he was baptizing, he said to them, talking to the church of his day, you brood of vipers, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Turn to that neighbor again and say, John had an attitude. <laughs> he had an appearance, he had an appetite, and he had, an, ap- and he had an, an attitude. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'll help me articulate truth tonight. I only want to speak truth, but I want to do it with the right attitude. I want to speak truth in love. Lord, as your word goes forth, Lord, grant to your servants in this house that we may speak your word. And once we speak your word, now, Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal that signs, wonders, and miracles be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. And, Father, after we pray, after we seek your face, we ask that you would shake this place where we have assembled. And, God, may we go out of this place and may we speak your word with boldness. And, God, I know you went with that early church and you confirmed your word with signs following. You went with them working and confirming your word with signs following. May they be filled so much with power and anointing that they would go out of here raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out devils and preaching and teaching all over the known world. May we obey that great commission and when we go we know you're with us and you're a very present help in a time of trouble and we know that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. I pray a group of risk takers would rise up out of this meeting this weekend and may we go and do the great exploits that you commanded us to do and God may we step out in faith may we never look to the left or to the right I pray we'll break the rear view mirrors off of our lives may we never look back may we press toward the mark of the prize may we be forerunners to your second return you are coming back and God you're looking for a people to be repairs of the breach and restorers of paths to dwell in you're looking for a group of people Lord to do the great commission to be 
committed to the great commission, the commission. Lord, it's a mission that you want to give us tonight. You want to send us with a message. You want to change our stance. You want to change our appetites. You want to change our very appearance, Father, and you want to change our attitudes. God, may we speak truth in love, super saturate us with the love of Jesus Christ, pour it on us, pour it in us, and let it be poured out of us as we go out into the nations and declare that you are Lord and you are able to save to the uttermost. We give you praise for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said amen. I love this powerful passage of scripture because you can draw all kind of parallels uh, with John the Baptist and the church of his day. You got to understand something. They literally tried to name him Zachariah after his daddy. Now his daddy had a great job. He was a priest in the temple and he went about doing the duties of the priest which is offering up incense in the temple. And see what you need to understand is his father was also a priest because he came from the, the priesthood of Levi. His daddy's daddy's daddy was also a priest in the temple and his daddy's great granddaddy and you just keep on going back. It was a lineage. In other words, John the Baptist, they tried to identify him. Back during this time, most of the time you were named after your father and it identified not only your identity but usually your calling and what you were put on the planet to do. But an angel Gabriel came and said, you're not going to call him Zachariah. You're going to call him John because God has a specific mission, a specific message, and a specific calling. See, it was John's birthright. All he had to do is put it in neutral and he was going to end up being placed in the temple serving just like his daddy. But he didn't choose to go the status quo. John chose something that was not politically correct. He chose something that would upset the apple cart for his vocation. As a matter of fact, we find out that he didn't choose to go the way of his daddy serving in the temple. Hey Amen. I want to whet your appetite because we were in the office just earlier today and I was telling Kyle about this message and he made a statement. I want to tell you what he said and it was so impactful to me. He said, God wants you to experience the prophetic in the wilderness instead of the pathetic in the temple. Can I tell you, God's calling us outside the four walls and when we go out into the highways and the hedges and start declaring the good news of the gospel, can I tell you, we become forerunners to a fulfillment. See, John the Baptist, his role on the planet was real simple. He said he was a repairer of the breach. In other words, he said he was going to be a restorer of paths. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm put on the planet to make the crooked places straight. I'm the fulfillment of that prophecy over in Isaiah chapter 43 through 5. He said, I'm going to bring the high places low and the low places are going to be brought up. He said, I am going to prepare. He's a forerunner to the fulfillment. He's the only man on the planet that could stand and say, listen, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, he's the only man to stand on the planet and say this, he's here, but yet he's coming. In other words, his role was to prepare a people for the coming of the Messiah, amen, and a lot of people couldn't see that Jesus was already on the scene, amen, because they had other lovers. They liked the washing of the pots. They were too interested in serving in the temple, amen. They had all these prejudice built up, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. That's why in this passage right here, they got offended at him because John the Baptist told them, you need to be baptized, and they got very offended. They said, who are you, John? Why don't you get an occupation? Why don't you get a real job? Why don't you get cleaned up? Have you looked at how you're dressed? Amen. Who are we? We're, we're Jew among Jews. We have Abraham as our father. What they're basically saying is we don't need to go through baptism, amen, because we have Abraham as our father. Why did they get offended? Here's why they got offended. During this time, see, the type of baptism and the only baptism during the context of the 
the time that John the Baptist was on the planet was something called proselyte baptism. And proselyte baptism is a baptism that was reserved for Gentiles. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to be grafted into Judaism, you had to do three things. You had to prove you knew and obeyed the law for about 12 years and they watched every move you made. The second thing you had to do if you were a male is be circumcised and have flesh removed from your body. The third thing you had to do, and that was the final thing, is you had to go through something called proselyte baptism. So when John the Baptist shows up on the scene and tells them they need to be baptized, no wonder they got offended. They said, we're Jews. Abraham is our father, our lineage. Hey, Amen. We are deserving. We don't have to be baptized. That's the only result. And Jesus said, we must needs be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, if those, those Jews that had just went through that proselyte baptism, then and only then would they have seen that Jesus, the Messiah, the one that they were fasting for his coming. They were absolutely memorizing the Torah. They were memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they couldn't recognize who he was because they wasn't willing to go through a baptism to drown those other lovers. See, they loved the washing of the pots. They like all that phylacteries. They like to stand up on a street corner and say, yee-hoo, look at me, I'm ready to pray. Look at me, I'm fasting. Look at me, look at what I'm giving. Amen, and it sure, I hate to say it, but I've been around the block a time or two, and it sure sounds like the church of our day. I'm not talking about a specific church. I'm talking about the body of Christ worldwide and nationwide. Amen. We'd rather look right as be right. And I'm telling you, we had a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. So John had a real straightforward message. It was only a three-point message, and wherever he preached it, it was the same three points. Hey, what would you think about a pastor that stood up every Sunday? Pastor Philippi's back here, and if he stood up every Sunday and he preached the same message and it had the same three points. Repent was point number one. And point number two is the kingdom is at hand. And point number three is you need to be baptized. Hey, and I know he's grinning back there. He's like, yeah, that wouldn't last for about two, maybe three weeks. But can I tell you, his message was so significant that that was the exact same message that Jesus preached. As a matter of fact, that was the first message Jesus preached when he got baptized and got launched into his ministry and he went wild. The first place he got sent after he got baptized was in the wilderness and he confronted Satan himself and Jesus sent Satan packing by using the word. If the word uses the word, how much should we use the word? He said three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. You know what? He submitted himself to what the father said. The father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and he wouldn't let the devil talk him out of his identity. Can I tell you, some of you may have let the enemy talk you out of your identity. I'm telling you, you are called, but not only are you called, but you've been chosen. You're the called out ones. You're the ecclesia. You're going to come out, and when you come out, you're going to come out leading a nation. There's some Moses in here. You had an experience at the burning bush, but you lack confidence. God says he's going to put words in your mouth like he did Moses, and if he has to, he'll give you an Aaron to speak to you. Can I tell you if God wants to, you see when we want to move from one house to another, we use two old men and a truck. But when God wants to move a nation, he'll use two old men and a stick. See, God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. And when he finds you're available, he'll pour out of you and pour through you power from on high. Somebody, anybody, everybody, all the body, you could praise him. You should praise him. You ought to praise him, but some of us have got to praise the Lord. Can we praise him tonight a little bit in this place and shout because God's calling us. See, he's calling you to more than ceremonialism. He's calling you out of ritual and ceremony. He's calling you to take a risk. He's calling you to extreme measures. He's calling you out of the comfort zone. He's calling you to more than sitting, soaking, and souring. See, I am totally convinced, amen, that if we don't 
pour out, we will spoil. Literally, the Spirit of God is given for the purpose of you being a witness in Mozambique, a witness in Quito, Ecuador, a witness on a 17,000 foot mountain in Lorraine, Canada. I'm telling you, and I've experienced anointings, special anointings, and I felt the presence of God. But can I say, and I've been in some of the most spectacular spectacular, power-packed church services and conference, conferences that are even possible on this planet. But can I be truthful with you? Don't you want me to be authentic? Don't you want me to tell the truth? I'm up in a pulpit. Let me tell the truth tonight. Can I tell you the degree of power and anointing that I feel is absolutely connected to how much risk I'm taking, how much physical discomfort I'm feeling? I don't know about you, but that's my testimony. I've discovered if I'll get out there where there's nothing, there's no sound system, there's no props, God is either going to do it or it's not going to be done. When you get in that kind of a desperate situation, I'm telling you, God will show up. God will show out. God will put a word in your mouth. He'll stir gifts up in you. You will raise the dead. You will heal the sick. You will cast out devils because that's the will of God. Somebody praise him if you know that's possible and that he'll work that through you. This is a level playing field. See, why lean on second and third hand information when you can ascend the mountain yourself on Mount Sinai and get a word that'll shake a nation? God's talking to some of us tonight. He's calling you to a place that you've never been before. He's calling you, and now here's where it gets rough. Amen. Let me tell you something about God. God, when he calls you, will equip you. And if he will equip you, he will protect you. Never forget that God is sovereign. We act like the devil can just take us out anytime he wants to. Can I tell you, not only when I step out and take a risk, but I feel the presence of God. Amen. I feel like I can run through a troop and leap over a wall when I'm out there with nothing to lean on, don't have a microphone, don't have a sound system, don't even have a bottle of oil. My Lord, if we try to plug up a sound system, it sounds like this. In the name of Jesus. That's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like on over in Canada. But can I tell you, 74 people received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 500 Bibles got passed out. Can I tell you, we prayed for hundreds. Hey, glory to God. And I felt the power of God. Hey, so when you step out tonight, you don't have to step out in fear because God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but he's giving you power. He's giving you love. He's giving you a sound mind. If God didn't give you a spirit of fear, then don't receive it. You ever look at it that way? That's why Paul said don't receive in Romans 8 verse 14. If God don't give a thing, don't receive a thing. If it didn't come from God, don't receive it. And he's telling them, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Am I helping you tonight or am I just, some of you looking at me real funny. Right now, who's this madman, this wild man that's calling me out to the wilderness? Amen. But can I tell you, when you answer that call and when you respond to the, the mission, God's going to give you these three things that I mentioned. He's going to alter your identity. So much so. Now, if you're looking to be a popular... If you're, if you're looking to be, you know, because they're, they're going to, people think I'm crazier than a loon, amen? But what Kyle don't know is, uh, you know, he's crazy, I'm crazy, he's an adventurer, I'm an adventurer, and it's just a match made in heaven, amen? Uh, what he don't know is I used to do some whacked out stuff when it come to evangelism and outreach, amen? Good grief, anybody that would stand on the stage and break bricks for the gospel's sake, my Lord, they I probably got a screw loose, so I probably should have been the one getting prayed for in the altar, you know. 
But here's the thing, I've got a heart to see the lost that I'm willing to do whatever Gary Keelan can do. Whatever God's given me, if he's given me physical strength, I want to use that for the gospel's sake. If he's given me a good voice, I want to sing like these beautiful voices up here. If he's given me the ability to play an instrument, I want to do it and do it for the Lord, amen. And so I was always just willing to step out, amen. I was the one that got filled with the Holy Ghost and went immediately to the street, started carrying a cross on the street in some of the most drug infested places in Athens, Tennessee, got connected to the sheriff up there. He was telling me where to go and I saw so many people get saved and get delivered. I'd stand that cross up and they'd look at me. What does that mean? Oh, what a door opener for an evangelist. I'd begin to tell them this is where the old Gary Keelan died, was on a cross 2,000 years ago. Hey, they hung him high and straight. I'm telling you right now, it was an illustrated message I was carrying around. It was so easy like a hot knife through butter. I can't tell you how many murderers, rapists, drunkards, perverts got born again, hallelujah, and ended up coming and attending Woodward Avenue Church of God, and that church went from being basically a Baptist church, amen, singing off the wall, to being this fired up, Pentecostal, devil-chasing church that tripled in size over the space of two years, simply because somebody that got filled with the Holy Ghost was willing to step out, and I wasn't the only one. I'm telling you, there was about a group of 100 people, then they were wild, compelling them to come in. And the church grew. I got to hurry. As a matter of fact, I started going out and doing all I knew to do. And I would organize these outreaches. And I was a kingdom person even back then. I would try to get the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Catholic, the one God, the two God, the three God, the glory to God, anybody to help me out. If you had a singing group, come on, I'll line you up and I'd work these things out. And I buddied up with a manager of Walmart in Athens, Tennessee. Never forget this. The man turned out to be an on fire Methodist. Come to find out not only did he manage the Walmart in Athens, he was also the minister of music in his Methodist church. And he saw some of the equipment that I was carrying out there. Now, I, I wasn't the musician, okay, but I was a roadie. I carried the stuff out there for the musicians. And I'd line them up and put a stage up. He let me put a stage up in the Walmart parking lot. Let me go to the front of the Walmart and talk to people about Jesus, give away stuff right there in the front. He let me give stuff away that they were selling in Walmart. That's how good of a relationship I got connected with him. Well, one day, our keyboard stopped working. He said, don't worry about it. I bought a brand new keyboard. I'm going to let you use it. And I want you to use it in this, in, in this outreach you're getting ready to do on Saturday. He said, my business has increased because y'all been coming. See, we were doing it all summer long, <laughs> putting a stage up all day long. I had flag waivers. I had drama teams. I had preachers. I had preachers. <laughs> I had testifiers. <laughs> I had people t- uh, telling about, you know, I was once lost, now I found, you know, on and on. And uh, we would line them up, just boom, boom, boom. One day, one of my workers come running toward me. Brother Gary, you got to come back to the stage. I was down there witnessing to somebody. Turned around and looked, and there's smoke coming up from behind the stage. I thought, who's that? sending smoke signals? We're preaching here, but we ain't sending smoke sp- signals. Come find out one of the groups I'd invited. <laughs> you know, they were saved. They just need to be sanctified real good. <laughs> they were smoking cigarettes so fast that they lit the mulch up on the trees that were planted behind the stage that we had to go up there with a fire. True story, and put fire out. <laughs> Well, one day, the Lord said, "Uh, I want you to put a banner up on the side of this Walmart. And I thought, oh, now this is going to be strange. He's went for everything I've asked him. I don't know if he'll go for this. And I walked up to him, the manager now, and I said, hey, I've got a banner. And it says, Jesus saves. It was white and had red letters. Jesus saves is all it said. Huge. I said, do you, will you let me climb on top of the roof? and put out a sign that says, Jesus saves on the side of your Walmart. He said, yes, I will. And I was like, uh, you know how when somebody gives you permission you didn't really think they were, you, you, you start talk, you almost talk them back, back out of it. I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. I said, will you repeat what you just said? He said, yeah, go ahead, I think it's a good idea. Unbeknownst to me, now, it, the old Walmarts used to say, satisfaction guaranteed in red letters with a white background. Didn't know this at all, wasn't paying much attention. Me and my volunteers scurried up to the top of the building, hung the sign over the side, 
And if you stand back from it, it said, Jesus saves, satisfaction guaranteed. <laughs> Glory to God. Mick Jagger couldn't get any satisfaction. You know why he never found Jesus? Huey Lewis, hey man, he said, I want a new drug, one that won't make me sick, one that won't make me crash my car, one that won't make me feel three feet thick. Hey, Huey, I found him. It's Jesus, and he's got something called a pill called the gospel. You just never found what I found. So I hung a sign up. Now, on the Walmart, Jesus says, satisfaction guaranteed. From that day forward, and every outreach on Saturday, that's what was happening. Now, the people in the temple, the Zacharias in our church, sister shout about it, doubting Dan, and, you know, the little deaconette in a Corvette listening to a sermonette, going to the dinette, smoking a cigarette types. Well, I tried to involve some of our young musicians. I wanted them to do more than play in the temple, offer up sacrifice. I said, God's giving you that, that right there. Why don't you go out and help me win the loss for Jesus and get on this stage? I'll never forget this as long as I live. So we planned this huge event, and it was all day long. I had churches. Man, I had churches. About every church in Athens was involved in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Some of them would give. Some of them would do this, that, and the other. Because they wanted to see the community turned around. So we get out there, and it was an all-day event. And I'm telling you, a rainstorm came up about midday. And absolutely, it blew our tents. We had tents set up. It blew stuff. It, it absolutely, we'd had, we'd had stuff going from 8 o'clock. It happened about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I wasn't paying attention to the weather. And unbeknownst to me, Hurricane, I believe it was Opal, come up through the Gulf of Mexico. And if you look at the path of Opal, it went directly into East Tennessee. And that hurricane, it was by a tropical storm by the time it got into East Tennessee. But can I tell you, it rained cats and dogs. Even frogs were drowning. Well, we had some carnal, backslid musicians. No offense to a musician. But I was trying to get them out there in hopes that, hey, this will help them see the big picture. How many of you know sometimes we can't see the forest because we're too busy looking at the trees? We can't see that it's about the loss. We can't see it's really about missions. We can't see that the reason this church and every church in America exists is because of that drug addict that needs to be saved, that prostitute and that pimp that's sitting on a bar stool acting like a real fool needs to get born again of the Spirit, and we're supposed to be compelling them to come in. Amen. That's why we have these. That's why we get full of the Spirit. That's why we got filled up is we know we don't get full of the Spirit so we can wow and woo and impress our neighbors with our spiritual gifts with these gifts should be an operation in order to win the nations and to reach the lost and be a forerunner to the fulfillment. And you know Jesus is going to come back. When's he going to come back? I don't know. I just know this, that one day he's going to split the eastern sky and come back. But I do know what Matthew 24 verse 14 says. This gospel will be preached, the gospel of the kingdom, to every nation, and then the end will come. Can I tell you, you and I can be forerunners to the very return of Jesus Christ. When? When we get out there and reach the two billion people that don't have access to the gospel and when we got a thousand tribes to tell, how can we take it easy? How can we take it easy? Would someone tell me please? How can we take it easy with our world going to hell in a handbasket? How can we take it easy? It's time to get fired up, pepped up, primed up. It's time to get full and saturated with the Holy Ghost and let God send us into the highways and into the nation. And when they all hear the gospel, then Jesus will come back. So technically what God wants to put on us tonight is a forerunner's anointing. It's the mission mandate. Just like John the Baptist. Jesus said, if a man born of a woman never been a greater prophet alive. How would you like Jesus to say that about you? So I better hurry. These will be quick. Number one. His daddy wore robes in the temple, royal diadem, beautiful garments, dressed to the nines. His wife had a Barbie doll figure. <laughs> he had a Madison Avenue suit, and he had a Wall Street bank account. 
I'm putting it in their terms today. Serving, and it was legit. Serving incense in the temple and working there. And he had to work, I think, for two weeks and then they'd own rotation and blah, 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 blah. But man, he wore the best and the finest. But John chose a different appearance. He chose to wear camel's hair and a leather girdle just like Elijah. See, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist. Hey, the spirit of fire. And I'm telling you right now, what God wants to clothe you with is not camel's hair and it's not a leather girdle, but God wants you to pull on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, God wants to put something on you Ajax can't take off of you. God's wanting to put power on you. Can I tell you a poor King James English translation of Luke 24 verse 49 says this behold I send the promise of the father go and tarry until you get endued with power from on high that's poor translation of the original Greek in the original Greek it doesn't say be endued it says be clothed with power God wants to put a garment of power on you he wants to put a garment of praise on you he wants to put a garment of purpose on you it'll alter your very appearance I'm telling you and you're going to see a video of what happened in Quito, Ecuador of a man that got so transformed by the presence and the power of God. We have a before picture and we have an after picture. The glory of God was on his face so strong it didn't look like the same kind of person. I'm talking about a supernatural God. I'm talking about a spiritual God. I'm talking about a God that can do more in 60 seconds than we can do in a decade of planning and doing all of our posturing. I'm telling you right now it's time for you to receive the garment of power like Samson Oh, anybody want that garment and that change? Give him a shout of praise if you want him to put it on you tonight. See, in the Hebrew language, words that they had had pictures associated with them. Word pictures. One word would have huge meaning in the Hebrew language. So when the Bible says the Spirit of God came on Samson, you know what that means? Here's the word picture. It means God basically inserted his essence, inserted himself literally in the body of Samson. Samson's body was like a glove. God getting ready to do some work. When do you put a glove on? When you get ready to work in a garden or when you get ready to do some work. When God got ready to do some work, he would insert himself in 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 the King James it says that God came upon Samson. That literally means God used Samson's body like a glove. And when God inserted power inside of Samson, great things happened. He killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. He carried, you talking about feats of strength. He carried the gate of a city to the top of a, you talking about speed. He ran down 300 foxes, tied their tails together, set them on fire, sent them into the enemy's camp. I'm talking about a guy that took his bare hands when the power of God would come upon him and rip the mouth of a lion open. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about showing up at church in a suit and tie. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about playing plastic Jesus games. I'm not talking about regurgitating spiritual pablum. I'm talking about being born again and being so saturated with the spirit of God. I'm telling you right now, those that know their God will be strong and they will do great exploits. I'm trying to help some people here tonight. We're so subnormal that if we ever did get normal, people are going to call us abnormal. And you haven't arrived till they call you a cult anyway. We're going to have a sign up right out here called a far flung tin can cult. Who wants to join it? I'm the rhino, okay? And, you know, sometimes, you know, God works in spite of me. Half the time I was telling Cal, I just go mumbling, stumbling, bumbling by faith. And he shows up. You know why? Because when you go on a mission or you step out in outreach and go outside the four walls, you're right smack dab in the middle of the will of God because God said, it's not my will that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hey, are you hearing me? Hey, if it's not his will, and when we step out to go reach the lost, we're operating in the will of divine will of God. Amen. He said, I come to seek and to save that which was lost. I've got a question for every church in America. What have you come to seek after? 
I can tell you what you're interested in if you'll just let me glance at your budget. Is this too rough, Kyle? I'll sit down. I'll submit to authority. Because you can't be in authority unless you can submit to authority. He's in authority here, and if I say something, I'll be like, I'm just trying to listen. I'm serious about this. Because you know why I'm serious about it? Because I watched Brian Lindsay. I preached for his daddy and his uncle several times. And basically, you were a priest in the temple. And you got to hanging around the creek bank. I'm preaching to myself. I'm hanging around the creek bank. You're already dove in. You and Ashley <laughs> dove in. And I guarantee you some conversation was had. You sure you know what you're doing. Where are you going to get your food? See, you've been eating roasted lamb. Now you're eating locusts and wild honey. See, you used to be dressed. I don't know. I don't think you ever wore a suit probably ever in your life. Thank God. I pulled up a message from Damon Thompson preaching. You would know it. I pulled up a message of him preaching in Brownsville. He had those fake glasses that young people used to wear so they'd look older and get more respect in the pulpit. See, I know all the games. Because people won't have you when you're young. So you got to look older. So he had those fake glasses on. I know he's got 20-20 vision. He didn't have to have those glasses. And had that three-piece suit on. He didn't even sound like the same Damon Thompson. You know why? The man's went to the wilderness, had an encounter with an awesome God, and it literally altered his preaching personality. He did not, he didn't even look like the same person, physically or otherwise. That's what I'm talking about right there. So God wants to alter some appearance. The second thing is God wants to shift some appetites. Here's the thing about an appetite. You can say you love pecan pie, which I happen to love. And, uh, but if I fill up on everything else but pecan pie, there's only so much room in me, no matter how big I am. And I'm a big guy. I, I, I'm in the same category as Brian. You don't get this. You know, I'm not on slim slow. I'm on slim. You know, I'm not on slim fast. I'm on slim slow, Okay. But if I eat everything else, it doesn't even have to be my favorite food, and I get full of it, and you come to me with my favorite pie, guess what? I'm full of other stuff. There's no room. I have no appetite for anything else. See, this emptying that God is trying to do in me and in Brian, and he's not the only one to set an example. Jeremy, same thing. Serving in the temple. It's a good thing. Some need to serve in the temple. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you got to do what God's called you to do, but I think you're at eminate because God's calling you out. I think God, God don't call the qualified. He qualified. And he quoted this. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. I believe I'm in a room full of chosen people. As a matter of fact, I told Pastor Rick, I said, Pastor Rick, have you ever, has God ever given you a message and you thought for an instant, oh, the, the people I'm needing to preach this to aren't in the building. He said, don't worry about it. It's being recorded. <laughs> and the ones that need to hear it that aren't in the building. See, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. That's well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying, God, don't let me rough them. This is the cream of the cream. Of the cream. This is, the, this is the, the remnant here at Emanate on a Friday night. Lord, why am I preaching like this? Because the best is yet to come. A lot of good things have happened through far flung tin can, but we need you. You're an important part of the mission. See, God can do anything without us. God don't need us. That's arrogance and pride to think, well, Mozambique ain't gonna be one if I don't hop on out there. Horse feathers. God's sovereign over the whole thing. One way or the other, it's gonna get done. But the question is, are you gonna be a part of the mission? to get it done. See, he's sovereign, but within that sovereignty, we have a responsibility that God has given us. We are God's hand extended. You realize that, don't you? He's the head, and you're a part of the body, but you're God's hand extended, and God could do it without us, but for some reason, God chooses not to. The other part of that 
is this lone wolf, lone ranger thing that's so prevalent in the body of Christ. See, I can't do it without you. Don't want to, and it's not the will of God. We are a many-membered body joined and jointed by that which every joint supplies. So don't you let the devil beat you up and say, what have I got to offer the far-flung tin can? What have I got to offer the mission? I'm telling you, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, and faithful is he who has called you who will also perform the doing of it. God is working in you. Do I have to quote all the scriptures tonight? It is God that's working in you to will and do of his good pleasure. Be God inside-minded. So if God is in me, I don't have to pray for healing to come from out there. It's already in me because the healer's in the house. You're the house of God. You're his temple. You're his garden. You're his and his alone. And you're an heir and you're a joint heir with Christ Jesus. So we got to do this together. Corporate America calls it synergy. We call it unity. That's where synergy is simply this. The whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts added together. We can do more together than we could separately added together. Does that make sense? So tonight, God wants to unify us on a mission. He wants to put a message in our mouth. And I don't know, I want these musicians to come up here, but the third and final one is God wants to put an attitude in you. Did you know John the Baptist, if he showed up in most churches in America, the safety team, they wouldn't make it past right there. We got a place for you, it's out there in the street. Take your phone, log on that way, but you can't come in here. Sign says, anybody caught trespassing will be shot on sight. So I jumped the fence and yelled to the house, what gives you the right to keep me out? Hmm, some of you don't know your 60s and 70s secular songs. See, we love John the Baptist. He's our hero, but we like him dead. Because if the live one showed up, we wouldn't like him too well because he didn't look like the status quo. He wasn't going to fit in that little box. God's not stamping out cookie-cutter evangelists and cookie-cutter missionaries. He's got a unique calling for everybody in here, and he's building his church, and they're not made out of stones that don't all look alike. Amen. We come from different sides. Me and Kyle, we talk about it. We don't have anything in common but Jesus. But guess what? That's enough. And the other thing we have in common we got a heart to see the mission accomplished in the world, wherever that is, and we are adventurers. See, if you're not careful, you'll let the people in the temple put something on you that's not, you're not meant to be put on you. Remember the story I told you about the hurricane that interrupted our outreach? I had a woman walk up to me. Brother, as soon as they start that brother stuff, I know nothing's coming out of their mouth but doubt. Now, Brother Gary, I believe if it had been God's will for you to do this outreach today, it wouldn't have rained. Hmm, interesting theology. And if you come at me with a theology, I'm going to hit you with about 10 scriptures. I said, my Bible says that God caused it to rain on the just and the unjust. I said, Paul said he was stoned and left for dead at Lystra. He was a day and a night in the deep. He was beat with rods, three times beat by the Jews. He was naked, destitute and afflicted, despaired even of his life. Paul said, I was troubled on every side, yet not distressed. I was perplexed, but not in despair. I was persecuted, but not cast down. Hey, always bearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifested in my mortal flesh. So her theology didn't fly because God would literally have to apologize for the Apostle Paul for everything he went through. And you're telling me the writer of the New Testament wrote 13 books, amen, that he wasn't in the will of God? Are you kidding me? Well, Brother Paul, if you'd have been in the will of God, all that wouldn't have happened to you. She was hitting me with that. (laughs) 
And I don't want to be mean to nobody, even if they are Pharisee or Sadducee. What she didn't know was when that rainstorm hit, I had some of my workers come running up to me. I'll never forget this as long as I live. They said, come here, Brother Gary. You got to help. I said, what's going on? What's going on? Driving rainstorm, Kyle. I don't know what it is about the driving rainstorms. They take me over to this van. There was a mother and her best friend sitting beside her and six kids. I'll never forget this as long as I live. Sitting in the back of that van. Looked like they hadn't had anything to eat. Dirty. They were sitting in the Walmart parking lot, desperate, completely out of gas. No gas in the vehicle. I started. I pulled the door back and it's raining so hard and I, and I had some, some female uh, uh, volunteers with me some male just for accountability and I said do you mind if we crowd in here with you we get up in that van she starts telling her story and I looked and one of her kids had cleft palate she said he's scheduled for surgery up at the University of Tennessee at the medical center to try to fix that cleft palate she said we have no money I have no gas. I said, well, are you married? Where's your husband? She said, my husband's on a binger. Haven't seen him in seven days. I started crying. I said, God, you got to help me. I'm powerless with respect to this situation. It's too complex. I can't. God spoke to me. He said, but I can My workers go running into Walmart. They bought 200, I think two or $300 worth of groceries. I said, I sent one of the other workers. They went and filled up gas cans. We come back, filled our vehicle up, and with the empty gas cans, we put extra gas in there. I said, now, I got to ask you the most important question in the world. We've given you this food. We've given you this gas. And we're going to do more for you. We want you to come to the church in the morning. But I said, I have to. I have to. Because the most important decision you could ever make is to accept Jesus Christ. I said, all this is good and even benevolence. And it's a great thing to do this. But I said, first things first. You've got to get a man in your life. By the name of Jesus. Who can alter your situation. I said, I can do all this. We're willing to do even that. But I said, there's only one Savior. Are you born again? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? She shook her head and said, no, I don't. The, her girlfriend sitting there said, I don't either. The kid's just looking at me. I said, I want to ask you a simple question. Would you like him to come into your heart? Real simple. We make it real hard. I said, he wants to come into your life and transform you from the inside out. And when he comes in, he will absolutely turn your situation around because he's the king and he has all of heaven and he'll bring it to bear on your situation. She said, I want this man. We prayed with her. She accepted Christ. We prayed with her girlfriend. She accepted Christ. I turned to the kids. They were already weeping. They said, I want him too. Prayed with six kids. They received Jesus Christ. Eight people in a rainstorm from, from the rains off of a hurricane with a woman telling me if it had been God's will that you had that outreach, this rain wouldn't have come. Can I tell you probably if it hadn't rained, the woman, they, they would have never come and got me probably. I'd have probably been up there preaching. See how God works. You can go mumbling, stumbling, bumbling. We want to, you know, we won't do anything because we ain't planned enough. That's why I like going with Kyle. He plans. You got an outline. It's going to change. So if you're one of those people that can't handle change, we need to get, pray, get you prayed through right down here. Make you flexible. Next morning, sun shining, Sunday morning. We have our Sunday morning dress on. Guess who met me again 
back in the back to tell me. And you know what it was? Her son was playing the lead guitar in our youth group. She didn't like the fact that he couldn't perform very good when it first started raining. See, every devil has an underlying agenda. See, that's really what she was bothered about. She's trying to get a rock star. Trying to make him famous. And he didn't get the chance to do his thing. So she tried to spin that thing on me. And I said, sister, will you come with me? Took her by the hand. Now, now she probably shouldn't have done this, but I did it anyway. Walked right down. I said, looky here. I said, during that rainstorm, she got, and she had the biggest smile, that lady that got saved, and her friend sitting there, and all six kids, we had them a space reserve right on the front row. We had went and bought them clothes. They were in the Sunday finest. We had them sitting up right on the front row. I said, now, Sister Gail, Sister Sarah, you know every church has them. Sister shout about it. Sister Susie, I hope nobody has those names. But it doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. The spirit behind it is what matters. Abigail, whoever the case may be. She looked at me. She said, I'm sorry. She said, I was, had the wrong heart and the wrong spirit. She said, will you forgive me for saying what I said? And I said, of course. My goodness, we're just, we're just trying to do something for the kingdom here. No big whoop, okay? We've all said stuff and done stuff we shouldn't have said and done. Amen. And I said, that's what the blood, the grace is for. Amen. God's still going to use you, and he's still going to use me. And look here at the fruits of the labor. And guess what? Next Saturday, sister, I want your son to come on back. And give it another try. See, that's grace. That's patience. And that's kindness. Stand on your feet. I went way long enough. Crumble cookies are probably crumbling by now. If voices can break glass, probably my preaching probably broke those cookies out there. But first things first. See, God orders. I, I listen to stuff he says and I listened to two prayers Tobin prayed and I about fell out in the, in the altar because Tobin said, Jesus, baptize with your Holy Ghost and with fire tonight. Can I tell you, John told this, he said, I baptize you in water under repentance. If there's one coming after me, he's mightier than I. He said, I'm not worthy to carry his shoes. He's gonna baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire not many days hence. This is not one. You need the fire of the Holy Ghost because you will receive power when God's Spirit has come upon you. We've quoted it a million times, but listen to the passage. You'll be my witnesses. The purpose for the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not so you will talk in tongues, although you will. It's so you'll be bold and be a witness and have a spirit of prophecy on you because you can be a priest in the temple, but God's calling you to be a prophet in the wilderness. God wants you to experience the prophetic in the wilderness instead of the pathetic in the temple. Time's wasting. That knowing the time that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and chambering, not in drunkenness and wantonness, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you'll make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Every time I take a mission trip, I ask God to fill me with his spirit. So my flesh won't have a louder voice and tell me, you got a wife and three kids. Why are you going to the top of a place that's known as modern day Sodom and Gomorrah for? You're going to get killed. You're going to get, they're going to call you a fool. You sacrificed all that, amen, for, for some, some little mission trip. But I cannot tell you, souls are weighed in the balance. And it's all worth it. That's why the Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust does corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven 
where a thief can't break through and steal. See, those people at La Rinconada, their number one wearing concern is if I do find gold, a thief is waiting around the corner is going to break through and steal what I found. Every soul that's won is treasure that's been laid up in heaven. Those that win souls are wise. Hallelujah. So the altar call tonight is God wants to alter our appearance, alter our appetite. He wants to give us an attitude. What kind of attitude? Love. And he wants to give us boldness tempered with love. He wants to make us God confident, not self confident. Boldness comes when the Spirit of God comes on you and my Bible says he went with them and confirmed his word with signs following and the Bible says and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus and great grace was upon them all. I don't know about you but some of you this year are going to step out. Tonight you're not to get the equipment for it. To get everything you need housed in the nature and character of the Holy Spirit. He wants to fill you. He wants to put you back together. He wants to pour you out. Can I tell you the woman with the alabaster box? She broke the box and Judas said she's wasting her life see John the Baptist was beheaded because he confronted the political system he confronted the religious and he ended up beheaded and you could look at John the Baptist's life and say what a waste 32 years old beheaded and the woman with the alabaster box they said she wasted a year's worth of wages but nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say about anybody what he said about the woman with the alabaster box he said this he said wherever my gospel is preached basically in Gary's paraphrase I'm going to make her famous for what she did what others think is wasteful ended up being something when she poured out that worship on the head of Jesus see she broke the vessel and that'll preach because a broken vessel can't control the flow So I get broken every time I go on a trip. Broken down like they say, like a shotgun. Like a, I get folded up like a lawn chair by the Holy Ghost. But can I tell you, once he gets me and molds me and shapes me into what he wants me to be, somebody that's humble and is putting total trust in him, that's when the power comes. When we decrease, he increases. That was the message of John the Baptist. He said, I must decrease so that he may increase. And let me tell you, friend, when he increases, can I tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Can I prophesy a little bit? The best is yet to come, far-flung tin can. Nations are going to be won. Revivals are going to be launched. Crusades are going to break out. It's going to break out all over the known world simply because we stepped out and we go mumbling, stumbling, and bumbling through the Amazon rainforest and we find there's a man, a glory to God that needs the gospel. We present a Bible launch a church. I'm telling you, it's exciting. It's adventuresome. Oh, so you got a choice tonight. Remain in the temple or get a message that will shake a generation and prepare for the second return turn of Jesus Christ who am I talking to so they're going to start playing and he prayed said God fill us with the Holy Ghost with power guess what that's God's will so God's going to do it amen who's he going to do it in everybody that's walking faith and obedience tonight he's going to fill you with power who who wants power come on down here as they start playing and I want Brian and some of the others And Kyle, we're going to lay hands on you. And God's going to give you a message. Little old me, yes, you. Father, I'm asking you to confirm this word out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let your word be established. Lord, you're called the call of the wild, Lord. And when they show up, God. How can they call on someone that they've not believed in? How can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel and bring good tidings and glad 
tidings of good things. That's who I'm talking to. Oh, yes. Go ahead and play it. We're going to pray for you.
Acts chapter 2 said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place, one mind, and one court, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind filled the whole house where they were sitting, cloven tongues of fire set upon them. Notice it said fire sat on them. Can I tell you, Jesus sat on a donkey. It's just a little donkey, okay? <laughs> Donkeys in the Bible are significant because God can speak through a donkey, but he can also sit on a donkey. Donkeys in the Bible either carried the message or they carried the messenger. So can I tell you that little donkey had the king on his back, carried him into Jerusalem for his final couple of days they laid palm branches down in other words God wants to sit on us tonight fire wants to sit on us because he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost with fire and people if you would just read our Bibles a little closer when it says Ephesians 5 18 19 don't be drunk with wine wherein it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms, singing to make a melody in your heart unto the Lord. There's six Greek tenses, verb tenses. That one right there, King James, again, does a poor translation there. It means be being filled with the Spirit. So some of you may think, well, I got filled with the Holy Ghost at the Why Mama Camp meeting in 1989. Why don't you come down here to the revival? Because the Bible says, be being filled with the Spirit. See, I got filled with the Holy Ghost just a few minutes ago when they were doing praise and worship. I got filled right there. Wait a minute, you preached the message tonight. You were supposed to already be full of the Spirit. I was, and I am, and I will be. See, they sing he's better. How are you going to discover he's better? See, you're experiencing the God that's here, but the God that's to come, you won't experience until you get be being filled with the Spirit. Everybody see that? See, John said he's here, but yet he's coming. So our announcement tonight is he's here, but yet he's on the way. Uh, are you tracking with me? I don't know about you, but the devil's 24-7, 365. And he's on task. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't step out in that street unless I got a double dose uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, unless I got the, the double portion like Elisha, then you're ready. Uh, then you're ready. Come and get a double dose. Come and get what you need. Come and get what? He's got something that'll cure you. He will cure what ails you in just a 60 second. Go ahead and sing it again. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Hallelujah. I want Brian and Jeremy to come on down here because I know their story and their background and I'm envious but I feel like if I can just get you in a prayer line let these gentlemen because buddy I'm telling you they took a leap of faith stepped out into nothing and here they stand and God I've sat and watched God just systematically 
supply their needs, make a way where there seems to be no way. I saw them when they come in. I saw the look on their face when they come in. And I see the look on their face. Can I tell you, their appearance is different. Their appetite got altered. And I see God transforming them. See, we look at missions like it's a university. I get my degree and then I go on a mission. That ain't how God operates. God's an apprenticeship program. Andrew, once he become a disciple of Jesus, he didn't wait on emanate even. He didn't wait on Ruach, Women of Fire, Wild Ones, you name it. You name your conference. If you don't like those four, name the one you like. I'll put that in there. Huh? Signs and wonders. Didn't wait on those. Andrew went immediately and said, Peter, that's Jesus. Follow him. How hard could that be? So I believe some of you are on the verge, you're on the edge, you're on the cutting edge, but you're on the bleeding edge. And I'm just praying because I believe as you come through here, God's going to use these two men of God as witnesses. He's going to, they're going to lay their hands on you. It doesn't have to take us a long time that you can just come right through here. I just feel like they need to lay their hands on you and whatever God tells them to speak, through and to and and into you they're going to obey god this man right here he's going to obey god if it hair lips every devil around it's what i like about him and that's what he needs to keep doing but you need them to just speak into your life and, and just to lay hands on you you feel comfortable with that i'm not, I'm not gonna get you doing nothing you know that you don't want to do brother amen so I want them, you, you come on down here, and just, just come on through here. And this doesn't have to take a long time. I just feel like they need to speak and pray over you. Is that all right before we do that? Is that all right, Kyle? Amen. Because they epitomize the message tonight. See, I preach the message, they walking in it. Because they've been, I guarantee you, they've had some skeptics and critics say, what in the world are you? Well-meaning people, good people, godly people. I'm not saying they're not godly. I'm just saying that, you know, Huh? Oh my Lord! I can, they're, they're, it's their story. I'm gonna give them. A, I'm gonna. You, you guys do what you, you tell it. Whatever you want to tell of the story. I'll make it real short and sweet. Uh, it was the middle of a global health pandemic and economic crisis, and uh, my beautiful wife, uh, with her support. Uh, 10 p.m. one night we loaded up the car and drove overnight because we felt like that's what we needed to do to be obedient uh, so she was pregnant and we walked away from house salary health care was just like if this is what you want us to do then I guess it's on you to, to take care of everything and that was a little over a year ago and boy has he taken care of everything um, so our story is just trying to be obedient and uh, putting God in a position to where uh, he has to stay true to his word, and he does. Nigga, I just say how proud I am of this guy right here. And his wife in the back. I'm so proud of this guy right here. Man, I feel like so many times, like, I get so much credit for stuff, but, like, I look around the room, there's some risk takers in here. Wow. You guys, man, just jumping in. Believe in God to direct your family. Think about Jansen and, and just following the direction of the Lord in ministry. Just believing that God's going to direct you. You know, different ones in this room. Just, just risking it. Just going for it. Um... Our story has risk in it. You know what I really feel like instead of just telling, like, our story's similar. We risk stuff, he risked stuff. You get it. We left things and now we're here. Now we don't know how to live anymore. Uh, this is what I feel like the, the Holy Spirit is saying. And I, I really think, like, I don't know you guys over here, because I felt like the Lord spoke this to me when I prayed for you. And I don't think it's just you. But like what God is weaving, what God is nodding up is so powerful. Like what God is doing 
in like your story, your life. Like, I don't know you guys. Are you all together? Like what God is doing, the enemy is so freaked out. He is desperately trying to undo it. Like he is desperately trying to undo the things God is doing. It's like we have savagely protected what God has done in our lives in the last little bit. This was not just about leaving one job and and having another job. For us, I'll be honest, it was about leaving one yoke. It was about leaving leaving one lifestyle. It was this yoke and and one day I finally I finally heard this voice and it was like it's time to trade yokes. We're going to leave you need to take my yoke upon you. Yeah, it's just, he said, take my yoke, let me do. And I feel like what God is doing, we have savagely like protected it. Every time something feels like what life used to be, I'm like, no. Every time I'm nervous about money, I refuse to call donors. Every time, every week that I'm scared about money, I refuse to fundraise that whole week. I won't do it. I'm not going back to that place of fear or nervousness and all that. I think there are other people here that either have recently taken a risk, maybe a step of faith, moved your family to a new city because you felt like God, maybe it's the ministry thing recently in the last year or two, you recently taken a risk or you feel like maybe there's something like in the horizon there's some risk in the horizon like you feel like God's pulling you you feel like God's doing something that is that the enemy would like to undo I think about the, my girls that went to Africa where are my girls that went to Africa where are my little African girls they're not actually African sorry we have African people that we love and stuff but the girls that went like God what God did and what God is doing the enemy so desperate would like to undo that he would so desperately like to undo what the Lord did. And so I just think, Gary talked about us praying together. You may be coming through and, and, and that's fine if it, but, but I kind of feel like maybe if that's you, I'd like you to just all gather in close. You said speak over. I, I, I said this the other day in a candid moment and I was like, oh, I got to say that more. So I'll say it right now. You know, a lot of times we talk about God working in our life and we talk about the opposition that we face and I think I grew up in the church and I feel like we talk a lot more about what the devil is doing so I was talking to somebody and we had a different perspective on the same scenario because they were convinced that the devil was just working that he was just working and work well the devil you know he doesn't stop you know we talk about all all the time just the devil he's just constantly uh seeking looking for people to devour the devil idle hands or the devil's work we just every you just the devil's always doing something but we act like we have to convince god to do anything so this person was talking to me and i started getting angry and i said you know That's one way to look at it. And then I said this, and it stuck with me. I said, but you know, I'm convinced and I'm dedicated to believing that my father is working a lot harder in my life than the devil ever could. It's because a lot of time in church, we lean the other way and we talk about how much the devil is doing. And it hit me one day. The devil can't outwork my father. So if I want to speak into somebody's life tonight, I want to remind you, no matter what's going on, no matter what it looks like, if you can step back and change your perspective and realize that it's as hard as the devil is trying to work in your life, you have a heavenly father who is more powerful, who is more loving, who is all good all the time and he's working harder for you than the devil is working against you. Trust that. Believe that. Yeah. Um, how you want to, this is, this is going to kind of be like a closing prayer. We're going to pray. Um, and uh, 
I don't really have like a format for it. How about this? If you want us to pray, we're going to kind of walk. We'll like walk together and pray. There's nothing magical in us. I'm going to ask maybe Becca if you want to come down. If the kids are cooperative, you come with us. Um, and we're going to pray. If you want prayer, if you're on stage or if you're here, if you want prayer, just throw a hand up. Remember, like maybe if you're, if this is stirring you, like, hey, man, y'all pray for me. Uh, just throw a hand up so, we, so I know, like, hey, man, they're feeling this. If you're just hanging out for the cookies, we'll be to there in a minute. There's some cookies out. If you're just here for the cookies, welcome. Thanks for being here. We love that. Um, but if you're like, man, hit me, I, I, I would love that. Just just keep your hand up. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're going to start right here and just, just pray. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And as we pray, you can just stretch your hands and we'll just all do this as a family. Yeah, man, he, right now in the name of Jesus, I trust you. I refuse to fear. God, if you're not worried, I'm not worried. If you're not scared, I'm not scared. I refuse to be afraid. It's not even really, it's not so much a risk as it is just a step of obedience. I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna trust you right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk this thing out. I'm gonna believe that the Lord's working a whole lot harder and more effectively than the enemy is. So I curse every lie spoken over you. Right now we pray it wither and die. Every lie spoken in your life, we pray it wither and die in the name of Jesus. Man, we just, we just believe. How many believe God's doing something special in her this weekend? We agree on that. And praying for anybody who's like, man, I want, I want prayer. Man, I believe I believe in the transition that God did and is doing and is working in your life. And the enemy would love to try to undo and to try to try to move. But like, I just refuse. That's not, man, God is setting things up and setting things in order.